Good morning. So, um, I need to get something out of the way. The podium. Speak without it. So.
she wouldn't mind. <laughs> I could get this, and it would be my surprise for our anniversary. <laughs> so I bought it. And I was just about to get to the door of the Emporium when I realized if I paid that much money for something, it should have a carrying case. Right? Because I'm going to bring it all the way back to Houston. I'm going to go through the portal in London, take the train, all that stuff. So I went back to the counter and I said, does this have a carrying case? And he said, oh, I should have told you. Of course it does. It's inside. And I thought, well, there is a, a velvet box or a bag or something inside of here. And he took it out, and what was in it was another box. A box. And I said, how is this a carrying case for this? And he said, oh, that's very, very, very simple. Um, if you reassemble this box like this, put this in here, and then if you take this dot, you can put it inside of here, and then you can put that there. And I thought, that's amazing. <laughs> The box that was on the inside is now on the outside, and the box that was on the outside is now on the inside. Holy smokes, I've already, I've already gotten something out of this. I left the emporium, and I was about down to the end of the block. I heard the village chimes ring. Five o'clock. Everything was closing. And then it hit me. I didn't get any instructions for this. I don't know how to make it work. So I went back to the emporium, it was closed. And the guy who runs it had already morphed back into a China person, a China man. He didn't speak English. I banged on the door and I said, instructions, I need instructions for the drive back in box. And he said, instructions inside. What? So I opened it and the die was gone and there were the instructions, all in Chinese. I don't read Chinese. I don't understand this. So I can't show you the truth. <laughs> I could tell you how to do that. Then I'll have to kill you. Okay, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Okay. Begin with a question. Do flowers spring up everywhere you walk? These talks that I offer here in Ordinary Life are a reflection of my own ongoing quest for the unfathomable mystery that is God. And though I know that the lifelong need for religious and spiritual clarity that I have is beyond the barriers of language that doesn't keep me from trying to speak about it. I speak about what cannot be spoken of. Now, my hope and desire is that what happens in these talks and our times together both reflect and transmit a living spirituality that can nourish, guide, transform our lives and our living. We are living in a time where we desperately need that kind of nourishment, not junk food. We need reliable guidance and genuine transformation. So I am torn by a passion <clears throat> for intellectual clarity when it comes to matters of mind and spirit and by the absolute conviction that no intellectual statement could ever fully express to the human mind the great truth that is, at the same time, 
profound darkness and intense light. You with me? Because it's going to get deeper. Because I was born into the Western world, I was given a religion about Jesus that taught me not that Jesus was the way, but rather that Jesus is the end. This religion taught me that if I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, my soul would go to heaven when I died. Now what I know, or think I do, is that immortality does not mean endless life, but rather it means an awareness of another dimension of being, the eternal in the now, the intersection between timeless and time. I have also come to see more clearly as time passes that it is organized religions on willingness and or inability to meet this need that accounts for the church's lack of credibility. So I'm going to say it again. Within the Christian tradition, Jesus is the way, not the end. Jesus is the way to be. A curvature of the spine was given to the church by misunderstanding and misteaching this very truth. Mystery was trained out of Christianity and it was reduced to doctrine by some and devotion by others. There are words in a poem by Francis Thompson that capture my sense of sacred mystery. All things hiddenly to each other linked are so that thou cannot stir a stone without troubling a stone. This is my way of stating what the phrase divine entanglement means to me. Everything, everyone is connected. Our task is to manifest this. So navigating the territory between an understanding of ourselves, each other, and the world that is passing away, and living ourselves into and willingly enabling the birth of a new paradigm that is not yet is what I have been trying to speak of for months now. Let me give you a brief overview of the territory we've covered, very brief. We talked at the beginning of the year about how theistic religion needs to be replaced by a more accurate understanding of the sacred and how all of our categories are being affected. All of our categories are being affected by evolutionary insight. We talked about how it happened that the great loving spirit got replaced with an angry god in the sky who is mostly removed from life. We talked about how fundamentalism got introduced into American life and culture to the point that it became simply part of conventional wisdom to take the Bible literally and to believe that the world was 4,000 years old. We've talked about how we can learn, how we need to learn to read and understand the Bible metaphorically, and perhaps even more importantly, how we can learn to be comfortable with uncertainty. Now the first and most insistent question I get when I give talks like this or cover that kind of territory, either in individual direction or in, a, in somewhere else, is, okay, what about prayer? If you don't believe that there is an external theistic God out there, who do you pray to? And so we spend a lot of time talking about that, about spiritual practice in general. And I will say to you, that though I do not understand it, my experience, and your mileage may vary, is that the more we give ourselves to religious and spiritual study, that is, the more we work to grow in knowledge and information, the more we experience sacred mystery in our spiritual practices, that is, the more we grow in wisdom and understanding. This farm couple are riding in their pickup truck back home from their weekly Saturday shopping trip into town. She was sitting by the door on the passenger side of the truck. He's driving. And after a long period of silence, she says, Henry, do you remember when we were first together, we would drive and you would put your arm around me. Sometimes you'd rest your hand on my leg. Sometimes when it was safe, you would even kiss me as we drove. 
We don't do that anymore. <coughs> Henry was silent for a moment, and then he said, it ain't me that moved. <laughs> Some of us start out on the spiritual adventure like we're dating God. It's exciting, and it's fun, and there's a lot of payoff. But there's a big difference between that and a living, growing, intimate relationship with the sacred. And it's so easy for us to get to take it for granted. Because the most visible form of Christian religion in our culture is the face of Christian fundamentalism, I'm currently in these talks deconstructing the tenets of Christian fundamentalism. This is including the claim that the Bible is divinely inspired, infallible document that should be taken literally. And I'm formally finished with that, but I'm sure we will return to it as we go along. I just finished dealing with the Christian fundamentalism teaching about Jesus being born of a virgin. The teaching about the virgin birth is one line that is taken from two parables that were constructed to introduce the readers of Matthew and Luke to the Jesus story. And although all the fundamentals of Christian fundamentalism are important to those who hold them, the virgin birth is a litmus test. So now we're going to deal at some length with this tenet of Christian fundamentalism, that the miracles performed by Jesus are real and that they literally happen. By the way, if you look up Christian fundamentalism in your search engine, you will find a couple things. One, the listings of them are somewhat slightly different from place to place. They're all covering the same thing. And you will find that the teaching about the importance of the death of Jesus, substitutionary atonement, precedes the one about miracles. But I'm putting this first because I think it lays the foundation for what we will be talking about sometime later about both death and resurrection. Still with me? Especially the part about speaking about what cannot be spoken of. So do flowers spring up everywhere you walk? Knowing that I was eventually going to deal with this tenet of Christian fundamentalism about the miracles of Jesus being real, literally happening, I started thinking about miracles in other religious traditions. And the first one I thought about was taken from the stories told about the life and enlightenment of the Buddha. Now, there are two main stories that are told about the Buddha. Uh, and they differ from place to place. This is very, very old stuff. One is that Buddha was a young prince whose father not only wanted to groom him to take over the kingdom when he died, but he also wanted to protect his son from the harsh realities of life and protect him from any negative experiences in the world. So he indulged his son's every whim. Decadent or otherwise, he got to do whatever he wanted to. This young man's name was Siddhartha Gautama. He was born five or six hundred years before Jesus. And according to this version of the story, his every whim was satisfied. Eventually he married and he had a child. Now that lets you know right now that he was not spared any negativity or, or unpleasant. <laughs> Right? Because anybody who's been married for a while knows what it's like to want to cheerfully kill your spouse. <laughs> and everybody who's had babies know how stinky they can be. One day without his father's knowledge, Siddhartha left the palace with a carriage driver. And on this outing, or on four different outings, depends on which story you read, he saw four things. He saw an old person. He saw a sick person. He saw a corpse, and he saw a renuncia. And this introduced him to the facts of life, aging, sickness, and death. And the renuncia pointed him toward hope. Maybe there is a way through or out of this. We are all of the nature to grow old, get sick, and die. 
and we inherit the results of our acts of body, speech, and mind. Our acts are our continuation. So Gavin renounced the luxury of the palace. One night, like a real man, he looked in on his wife and child and then snuck out. He tra I mean, these things, he's enjoying father's thing. He's got some character, you know what I'm saying? He tried for years a well, practice of renunciation, but never found the peace that he was looking for. So he made up his mind to go sit under this tree called Bodhi Tree and decided not to move until he achieved enlightenment. And it is said that after days and days and days of sitting, fighting off the evil one, he finally achieved enlightenment. And when he got up and walked away, flowers bloomed every step of the way that he took. I can get my pointer. I'll show you something. Amazing box. And there's another version of the Buddha story. This one says that Siddhartha Gautama, the future mother, that his mother dreamed that, white, that a white elephant pierced the right side of her body. So he was immaculately conceived. He had a special conception. So virgin births are not rare in these, in these stories. Nine months later, she gave a birth, a child, birth to a child. The child came painlessly from her right side and immediately took seven steps north with a lotus flower blossoming with each step that he took. Do flowers spring up everywhere you want? And there are many miracles attributed to Buddha. Um, among them are his ability to see into the future, to visit past lives, to see other past lives, his own and others. His greatest miracle is, is what is referred to as the twin miracle. Now, uh, you'll see a, a hint of this miracle in the Hebrew scriptures with Elisha and Elijah calling fire down from heaven. We'll get to that probably next week or so. Um, these miracles all have strikingly sim a, a similar theme. This is what was called the twin miracle because Buddha was debating some other spiritual teachers about the, the rightness and preference of his way the middle way, and he was able to manifest fire and water at the same time. So there is a statue of this with flames coming out of Buddha's shoulders and water coming out of his feet. This is called the twin miracle. It's very famous in, in, in Buddhism. Now, I could be wrong about what I'm about to say. And, and uh, you have no reason to believe anybody who claims he's been to Hogwarts. But <laughs> my hunch is that if I were to go into any Christian church today, Protestant or Catholic, and tell these stories about the Buddha, that everybody would dismiss them out of hand as nonsense. That never happened. That couldn't happen. That wouldn't happen. Those people made that stuff up. And yet, if I were to assert that similar stories told about Jesus were not factual, you would find a range of responses all the way from outright anger at such a preposterous statement to rather muffled discomfort. Oh, no, I'm not sure you should say stuff like that. Or, sure. <laughs> or anywhere for that matter. Way too sensitive. So, I want to say stuff like that in church. <laughs> I want us to spend some time talking about miracles then and now. I mean, it's going to take a miracle to change this world. And if we do not believe that the more beautiful world we each want and that our hearts know is possible, is possible, it won't happen. Now, I'm not talking about wishful thinking or positive thinking or creative imagination or making affirmations. I can affirm all day long that that table is getting closer and closer to me. And it won't move. The only way 
I will get closer to that table than study if I move. All right? The game's on. And evolutionary theology involves, and I'm paraphrasing Michael Dowd, knowing that the intent that integrity is our salvation and that we must do whatever we can to foster a just, healthy future for the full community of life. The game is on. That's our mission. The ball is in play. We are called on to be on the field. When I first came up 20 or so years ago with the principles of ordinary life, as I call them then, one of them, and it's the one I've gotten the most pushback about of all of them, is that we have a moral obligation to be happy. I believe that cheerfulness, this cheerfulness, this joy is the most important quality of a spiritual teacher. Your willingness to be here says that you're open to being that kind of spiritual teacher in the world. Enlightenment is not a solitary game. It's a group activity. When somebody sees you as cheerful, it's attractive. It communicates a message. And the message it communicates is, wouldn't you like to come over here? We have an obligation to live in such a way that flowers spring up everywhere we walk. So let's talk about miracles and the miraculous. You know, the people who constructed stories about Jesus included the fact that they experienced God in and through him. As I said at the beginning of today's talk, the unspeakable cannot be spoken. We can only stand and point. And often we use stories to do the pointing. And over time, people can begin to confuse these stories with factuality. So Jesus' followers told stories of his mighty deeds, of his wondrous acts, his powerful signs, in an effort to convey their experience of God's presence and power in him, in their experience of him. Now, I included the stories of Buddha today to let you know that Jesus was not the only miracle-working wonder worker of the time. Those who created their narratives about Jesus lived in a world where there were rich stories told about all kinds of divine humans who did miraculous things. In that world, especially in the non-Jewish world in which the Jesus story is developed, people had beliefs in many gods, in various gods. Other religions had their own scripture, Hinduism being the oldest, which was the religion of Buddha's time. One quick way to think about what Buddhism is, is that it's, it is Hinduism with all the gods stripped out. Okay. So people had different gods for different occasions, just like you do. Right? You've got a parking space God. <laughs> You've got a God of general safety and protection. There's the God politicians refer to at the end of their talks when they say, and may God bless us. As they speak the truth. <laughs> and we have the God that helps our team win. Yeah. Oh God, please let him score. <laughs> So many of the stories in the Christian Testament about Jesus are very in line with the miracle stories that are taken directly out of the Jewish scripture and from other cultures. Plus, there were many stories in the non-Jewish culture that reflect what people thought about divine humans. So here's one. True story. A remarkable man lived some 2,000 years ago. Before he was born, his mother knew he would not be a normal child. An angelic visitor had told her that her son would be divine. Miraculous signs and wonders accompanied his birth, and as a child, he was religiously precocious. As an adult, he left home to engage in an itinerant preaching ministry, teaching his good news that people should live for spiritual, not material things. He gathered disciples. He did miracles to confirm them in their faith. He raised the ire of many of those in power who had him brought up on charges before the Roman authorities. 
Even after he left this world, his followers claimed that he had ascended to heaven and they had seen him after him. They wrote books about his life, which writings survive to this day. Now, I did not just tell you the story of Jesus. This is the story of Apollonius of Tiana. He was a real historical figure, and we likely know as much about his true history as we do of Jesus. He was a very famous Neo-Pythagorean philosopher of the first century. He lived about the same time as Jesus. There's no evidence that he and Jesus knew each other, but their disciples knew each other because there are records of the intense arguments that they had about who was superior. It's the belief that Jesus is the end rather than the way that's kept this information out of Christian education. It's a shame that some of you are hearing this for the very first time. So in talking about miracles and the miraculous from a Jesus perspective, let's begin with gaining as much clarity as possible about Jesus himself. What people mostly think they know about Jesus are not actually teachings of Jesus, but whether they're teachings about Jesus. They're doctrines that have been, been created about Jesus, like the virgin birth, like the resurrection, like other things. <clears throat> and these doctrines have been created to determine who's in and who's out, who's going to heaven, who's not, who's part of the group or who's not. They've not been created with the explicit desire to say, this is the way that you can walk and have more peace, love, joy, and patience in your life. Actually, we know very, very little about the historical Jesus. He lived about 2,000 years ago. Uh, his life was relatively short, around 33 years. Most people in this room are older than that. Only three of his years were devoted to public ministry. One, if you listen to some scholars. Some people, not all to be sure, saw him uh, in him the power and presence and purpose of God. His very existence seemed to be marked by freedom and love. People who had been marginalized by society, those who were called unclean, found joy and acceptance in him and forgiveness. And those who were warped or twisted in all sorts of ways found in him a source of peace. He was a person who expressed and possessed what theologian Paul Tillich called of what Rudolf Bultmann called the authentic existence and what theologian Paul Tillich called the courage to be. Now, you and I could have no finer goal for our religious, spiritual, and psychological growth than these two things. Authentic existence and the courage to be who we really are. I heard Marcus Borg speak right in this room once, and he gave a summary about Jesus that was to me an example of Borg's brilliance. And here's what I have in my notes. This is, these are Borg's words. Jesus was a peasant, which tells us about his social class. His use of language was remarkable and poetic, filled with images and stories. He had a metaphoric mind. He was not an ascetic, but world affirming with a zest for life. And there was a social political passion to him, like a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King. He challenged the domination system of his day. He was a religious ecstatic, a Jewish mystic, for whom God was an experiential. He was also a healer. And there seems to have been a spiritual presence around him, like that reported of St. Francis or the Dalai Lama. And I suggest that as a figure of history, he was an ambiguous person. You could experience him and figure that he was insane, as his family did, or that he was simply eccentric, or that he was a dangerous threat. Or you could, conc you could conclude that he was filled with the Spirit of God. A few years ago, we went through a fad in this country of people wearing bracelets called with an initial on WJD, what would Jesus do? And at the time, my beautiful bride suggested an alternative, which was WWAGUD. What would a grown up do? <laughs> so, what's 
the, what's the primary goal of spiritual work? Psychological and spiritual growth. To grow up. Now, I know some of you think I skate on the edge sometimes in here, but you know, to tell you the truth, if I went around doing what Jesus did, I wouldn't have anyone to speak to. And I wouldn't have any institutional support to speak. Jesus seemed to have very little patience with religious and political establishments of his day. He unmasked religious pretension and profiteering. When we are part of corporal evil, and I don't know anybody in this room who isn't, we don't like it pointed out. Now you can rationalize any behavior. You do. I do. We want to. We can find a support group for any nonsense we want to practice. <laughs> Just look at the pedophile cover-up in the Roman Catholic Church. The religious and political leaders we so quickly judge and criticize, they're not bad people any more than you are or I am. They are simply living inside a story of such separation that it justifies not only, if, not, if it does not encourage acts of incredible injustice as being either necessary or inconsequential. At the same time, Jesus was an incredible lover. There's no denying the fact that lives were touched by his that were never the same again. When people heard him, they heard beyond his words. When they saw him, they saw beyond him to the power and presence that expanded him. Jesus was not about himself. His message was about the character of God and his teachings were about freedom and love. And the world that he described and called people to live in was very, very different from the Roman Empire in which they lived. For us, it is a call to live in a world beyond the one of consumerism and competition in which we live. Now this is tricky. Consumerism and competition are very much realities in our world and without them, we would be in big trouble. But what some people are beginning to see and say is that with them, we are in big trouble. What Jesus calls us to is a world where these things are not our gods. Perhaps this is why Jesus' disciples heard him say to those who sought to follow him, you must learn to be in the world, but not of it. If we could do this, flowers would spring up everywhere we walk. I hope you come back next Sunday. I'm not going today. I just. <laughs> And remember this, because today I'm building a foundation on um, which those future talks will be, be built, and I, I don't want to have to repeat all this. <laughs> I got multiple goals in my teaching. One is I want to reclaim both Jesus and the Bible from the distortions given to both of them by flat world mentality and from Christian fundamentalism. I want to reclaim Jesus and the Bible. Things. And this leads to the goal of increasing religious and spiritual literacy. Now, if we're going to do that when it comes to miracles, this means we have to learn something of the Jewish cycle of miracles and the Jewish tradition because Jesus was a Jew, a Jewish mystic. He wasn't a Methodist. <laughs> now, <clears throat> that's not in my notes. But I don't want to give the impression that the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures are packed full of miracles. They're not. They're very few in there, really. Very few. The Jewish have the impression there's a lot. But compared with Hinduism, compared with First Nations religions, for example, like Native American religions and some of the religions you see in, in Africa, the, the miraculous abounds. Not so much in Judaism. Not so much in Christianity. And we'll, we'll get to that. So there, there are miracles that are attributed to three groups of people, or three people in the Old Testament, Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. And all those miracle stories are replicated in the stories told about Jesus and his disciples. Got that? You'll see that when, when, we, when we get there. So what we know is the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture. The first miracle is when the children of Israel are escaping bondage in Egypt and they are well on their way 
when Pharaoh changes his mind and sends his army after these former slaves, and the Israelites come to what is called either the Red or the Reed Sea, and Moses extends his staff over the water, and the water miraculously parts, and the children of Israel go through it, I'm sure you've seen the movie, <laughs> on dry land, and then the army of Pharaoh with horses and chariots arrive. Moses lowers his staff, and all of them are drowned by the God to this very day. People think are going to come and go. Now, Jesus' story is connected with this, or calming the waters, walking on water, that sort of thing. In the desert, when people had no food, God, at Moses' request, rained heavenly bread on them. When there was a shortage of water, Moses struck a rock and the water flowed forth in abundance. Jesus fed a multitude with loaves and fishes. That story is told six times in the Gospels. And he does, Moses won better. He doesn't make water come out of a rock. He makes water turn into wine. <laughs> Now, in the Hebrew scripture, Moses is not the miracle worker. God is. Moses is only one through whom God worked. So when Moses died, Joshua, his successor, took up uh, the position. He was a military captain under Moses. And one of the storytelling traditions in Judaism is to wrap stories around about the deceased leader around his successor. They didn't see that as dishonest. It was due to convey that. The God of Moses was still with Joshua. So Joshua's life is said to be marked by the same power that Moses had. So Moses had been portrayed to command the forces of nature. So Joshua now would de demonstrate that similar power. So you know what he did. He commanded the sun to stop in the sky. This would enable Joshua's army more daylight time in which his soldiers were able to kill more retreating Amorites before they found safety under the cover of darkness. This just seems the kind of thing God would love to buy into. <laughs> How the literalists deal with this, I do not know. The sun doesn't stop. This, oh, well, you know why. So, Moses and Joshua were connected to Jewish law. When Jesus came along, he needed also to be connected to Jesus, to the Jewish law, so they would tell some of these same stories about Jesus, but in a different way. Then we have a prophetic tradition in Judaism, Elisha and Elijah. Not only did these two men have the power to affect nature, but they also could expand the food supply. They had power to part water that stood in their way. They were said to heal people, and they could raise the dead. Elijah and Elijah. Now, after this, miracles pretty well stop in the biblical story until we get to Jesus when they were told they were quite similar to the stories about Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha that had developed earlier. Now, what are called miracles in the Jesus narrative actually follow, fall into four categories. They're, they're nature miracles. Jesus stills a storm. He walks on water. There are narratives about his being able to expand the food supply and being food and drink himself. Then there are raising the dead stories. There are five of them in the Christian uh, tradition. Um, actually, there may be only three because one of them is told twice. And then there are all the healing stories that we're familiar with. Jesus heals blind, he heals people who can't hear, he enables people to walk, and that sort of thing. And these same miracle abilities are attributed to the disciples in the book of Acts. So we're going to talk about many of these as we go forward. What did they mean when were they first told? What did they mean when they were heard? What might they mean by us, for us? So I just want to be clear, I believe in miracles. This is a miracle. This is a miracle that I can vibrate a couple of folds of flesh in my throat and create sound waves that go out through the air and strike your ear, and your ear can translate those into symbols that make sense to you. 
persevere. We take it for granted. I believe that a shift in perception that allows us to experience even a smidgen of non-duality is a miracle. And time and time again, Jesus enables me to make that shift. The very act of committing to peace, love, joy, and patience is a miracle, especially the patience part. <laughs> Try it. It allows us to transform a negative emotion of judgment into a compassionate one. To put the story of separation aside for a moment and replace it with one of mutual respect which God knows we need. Just the ability to be present is a superpower. It's the hardest thing to do in the world. But that's miracle enough for me. My prayer is may flowers bloom with every step we take. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and I will see you here next week. Thank you.